Good morning and welcome to the Cathedral of St. Paul. I'm Melinda and we're glad you've joined us for worship on this frosty Sunday morning. I do apologize that it's a little frosty in here. Um, so I hope you're, hope you're able to stay sort of, sort of warm. A couple of announcements in our life together. Today at 7 p.m. is Celtic Spirituality Night. Um, we hope maybe you'll come and find the space and the solitude and the silence refreshing for your soul. Um, additionally, uh, mark your calendars for February 4th. We're having a big celebration of Absalom Jones Day. Uh, he was the first African-American priest ordained in the Episcopal tradition, and so his feast day is coming up, and Chris has planned a great celebration of all sorts of music and things, so we hope uh, you'll consider coming and, and bringing along a friend for that. January also brings, as mentioned, several items of uh, organizational importance that no one really likes to talk about, but which are actually essential. The first of those is the annual meeting. The annual meeting is next Sunday following this service. It will be fun because we will have food and we will get to talk about the great things that happened this past year, the great things that we're looking forward to, elect new chapter members, which is always really exciting, and talk about money, which, I don't know, can be fun too. I, I, I love a good graph uh, and I have some really good graphs. So uh, you wouldn't want to miss out on my pie charts. Um, God forbid it. So anyway, um, hopefully you'll be able to come. On the note of finances, it's also uh, the season in which we talk about that here. So if you're one of our regular attendees, this conversation is for you, not if you're new. Um, uh, one of our chapter members, Lee Barker, will be at a table out in the commons area. If you have not picked up your stewardship brochure, please go see him and do so. We're using it as an opportunity also to we're making you come and pick it up because we want to make sure that our information is correct. So we'll have you check your address and your email and your phone number and find out um, you know, if you want envelopes or not so we're not over ordering, so we're saving like half of a tree with the envelopes, I don't know. Um, so if you'll just check in and let us know. It'd be lovely to have pledge cards back by next week so we could have some kind of idea of what we're looking at. I know that that is uh, not something some people like to do, but when you let us know how much you intend to give, it enables us to have an accurate budget. It also enables us to show adequate gratitude for the financial skin you have in the kingdom of God through the cathedral. And so um, that really is helpful for us. And it's part of just who we're called to be as the people of God, believing and trusting all of ourselves, including our financial selves to what God is doing in and through us in this iteration. So we hope you'll consider how you will help make all of this possible for the sake of our community. I believe that's it for announcements. So as we, in this time before worship begins, I invite you to settle into the silence and the quiet and to find yourself grounded in the deep grace and goodness of God.
Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. God be with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. reading from the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw that they, what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord.
reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. They're horrible people. They're unkind. They're cruel. Their culture and ideas about society are just untenable. They're barbaric when they encounter other people on the battlefield. They're the worst of the worst of the worst. And Jonah will not go proclaim God's word of repentance to them. The Assyrians are everything he detests, and everything Israel detests. They're just barbaric. And God wants Jonah to go proclaim a word of salvation to them? Yeah, right. Jonah does not want to see them saved from God's wrath. He wants the wrath of God to rain down on their bodies like fire, just like the Assyrians have rained fire on everyone else's bodies. He just doesn't think they warrant any kind of forgiveness, any kind of compassion. They're terrible. And so Jonah decides he will not go. In fact, Jonah would rather die than see God care for these people. And in fact, he almost does. 
Jonah, if you know the story, decides to flee the call to go to Nineveh. He hops on a boat. There's a huge storm out at sea. Jonah says, yeah, (laughs) you know, uh, this might be my fault. I'm sort of fleeing like a divine call. Throw me overboard. And the sailors are like, okay. They chuck him overboard. Storm stops. Jonah's going to drown, except in the infinite grace of God, like a huge fish just like comes up and eats him. And so for the next three days, Jonah stews in gastric juices in his own anger, contemplating all of it. And then the fish releases, shall we say, Jonah back onto land, a little pink from the encounter of the fish. And God comes at Jonah again, this is our text for the day, and says, hey, How about you go to Nineveh now? And Jonah says, fine. Goes and buys a pair of Merrells, treks to Nineveh. It's three days across. It's a huge city. So ostensibly, he should trek through the whole thing. Not Jonah. Jonah walks to the suburbs, like the bare minimum suburbs. Whispers, the wrath of God is coming. You should repent. Turns around and leaves. But, you know, the one merchant heard it, someone else heard it, word travels, and then the king hears it and decrees that everyone will put on sackcloth, ash, and repent. And what does the story say? God saved them. God did not pour out his wrath upon them. Meanwhile, our hiking friend Jonah gets word that God has spared the Ninevites, and he couldn't be more angry. He sits under a a, a vine and tells God, I just want to die. Like, why on earth would you save these people? They're horrible. They've done horrible things. I just would rather die. And the whole of the four chapters ends with God saying, come on, man. Like, shouldn't I care about all of these people and their animals? It's an ancient, ancient story, an ancient novel, right? Maybe. Maybe. Jonah steps out in the corner of State Street, clutching his paper cup of ember and forge coffee. It's 22 degrees outside, and it's frosty. And Jonah stands there, and suddenly, out of nowhere, unexpectedly, he feels like the voice of God is calling to him. Now, he's Episcopalian, so this is really unprecedented and unimagined, (laughs) right? No, the voice of God is not going to come in this way to Jonah. And it's going to be a steady growth in grace, but this isn't it. Clutching his coffee, he hears God inviting him to go proclaim God's love and mercy two places, to both the Democratic headquarters and to the Republican headquarters. And Jonah's an independent, and he hates them both. And he thinks to himself, I am not going to go. I am not going to go. These two, they're responsible for all the gridlock in this country. Nothing's going to happen because it's an election year. They're just going to make it worse for each other so they can spit vitriol. Their followers are evil, cruel, hating people who are both self-righteous in their own ways. And no, I will not go. And so Jonah decides he'll flee. He fortifies himself with a lovely, bold brew drink, so the caffeine fills him, and he hops on a bus. And the bus starts up State Street, but then all of a sudden, the snow intensifies. And it's a whiteout, not unlike the one I experienced on Sassafras Street this past week. And he can't see where he's going, and the temperature on the bus is getting colder and colder, colder than this cathedral. (laughs) And, And Jonah thinks to himself, oh, it's my fault. This is all my fault because I'm running away from God. So he tells the bus driver, like, just, I got to get off. You're going to die out there, says the driver. No, 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 that's okay. I'm okay with dying because I don't want to do what I'm supposed to do anyway. So just, just let me off, right? And so Jonah gets off and it's freezing and he lost one of his mittens along the way and his hat's inadequate. And he just says, I would rather die than do what you ask me to do. But the God of grace finds him, and a giant seagull swoops out of nowhere and swallows him up. And for the next three days, for the next three days, Jonah is inside, stewing in the gastric juices and in his own anger, until the seagull kind of releases Jonah back into Perry Square. And God says, well, (laughs) 
Now what do you think, Jonah? After being inside one of the grossest birds in all of my creation, are you ready to go proclaim the gospel to the people you've decided to hate? Fine, says Jonah. He laces up his boots and he walks over and he walks over and he opens the door to one, opens the door to the other, whispers, Jesus loves you and longs to be in relationship with you, and leaves. And he sits down under a tree in a snow, and he says to God, I would just rather die. I can't stand these people. And God says to him, why shouldn't I care about them and their families? The story of Jonah is about Jonah, not about us. It's not a story about personal forgiveness. Set that aside. It's not a story about personal traumas. You have to set that aside. It's a story about how Jonah, who's Israel in the story, wants to hate the enemy, distrust them, dislike them, and bar them from the compassion of God. And the story of Jonah, probably a novella, is meant to poke at that. You're God's people. Do you really want God to hate other people? I know the Assyrians are barbaric. Go to the British Museum. Boy, there's some doozy of some past, you know, palace gravings. It's awful. But are you supposed to hate them? Are you supposed to hate an entire collective group of people? Come on, Jonah. Come on, us. Some things don't change with centuries. Very easy to fall into us and them thinking, to distrust and dislike an entire category of people. And that's not what God wants from Israel. It's not what God wants for Jonah. I don't think it's what God wants for us. And the thing I appreciate about the Jonah story is, yes, God relents and all of Nineveh is spared. But also, God continues again and again and again to show grace to his super reluctant prophet. The story has some humor in it, right? I mean, Jonah is like the anti-prophet based on all the other ones, if you know your sort of Hebrew Bible catalog of the greats. No one else gets eaten by fish <laughs> or whale, as I learned it in my youth. Um, you know, and then the whole king repents, and it's kind of an interesting story, but it's meant to sort of get people who read it to think about their humanity and to see the humanity of the other. Jonah's miserable. Jonah hates. His own anger is eating him like this worm that eats the vine he's setting under at the end of the story. But time and time again, God keeps coming to him. God comes and invites him in the first place. Can you go to the people you dislike and distrust and be compassionate? Okay. You'd rather drown. Well, let's save you from that. Here's a fish. And now we'll put you back on land safely. Can you go now? And then Jonah does the bare minimum, but God doesn't even castigate Jonah for that. And when Jonah sits under the vine and says again he'd rather die than have his enemies be forgiven, God comes to him again. And the whole story ends on, the whole book ends on that question. Why shouldn't I have compassion for all of these people and their animals? Jonah wants God to be in Jonah's image. There are lots of horrible things people do, and it's humanly justifiable to want to put them at arm's length, to want them to pay. And the story of Jonah says, but that's not who God is. God in God's very nature is love. Trinity, right? A Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. To ask God to hate is to ask God to be not God. To ask God not to have compassion is to ask God not to be God. It's to ask God to have our and share our predilections and our dislikes in the categories of people we want to push away. And inside of all of us, there lurks a Jonah. The question is whether we can admit it or not. It might be that we're good Episcopalians and we don't expect to be confronted on State Street with a vision of, you know, prophetic message. It might be that we're good Episcopalians who want to believe that we love everybody. And the story of Jonah might sort of poke a little bit at that. Who do you distrust? Who do you consider to be the other from you? How do you really think about that group of people?
And if you want the story of Jonah to speak, you got to admit the truth. You know, our opening prayer, from whom no secrets are hid. We hide a lot from ourselves. And the rub of Jonah is God brushes that away and invites us to see it, but with a lot of grace baked into it. And it doesn't offer any easy solutions. It's not a meditation on mercy versus justice. Our psalm said that everyone gets repaid according to their deeds. Not in Jonah. <laughs> Maybe not in Jesus. It ends on a question for a reason. And it feels like that is germane. In the year 2024, as we have begun the delight of caucuses and primaries <laughs> and our own internal political drama around our own city council. The vitriol is gonna fly from every direction at every person. And the, the option to other is just in the water. To put people in categories and dislike them and distrust them is so easy. And sometimes it feeds something in us. And so I just wonder if there's a different way of doing it. I wonder as we begin to walk through this year in which society will be divided, our kitchen tables might even be divided, what will we do? Who will we be? And maybe the story of Jonah is just wildly relevant. So in the spirit of Jonah, I wonder what the book has to say to us. I wonder what group of people we want to demonize or push away or distrust or dislike. And I wonder where God is speaking to us. Come on, why shouldn't I have compassion on them and their families? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time and in this place, let us open our hearts to the Lord and bring forth our needs and concerns, saying, O oh Lord, for your love's sake, hear our prayer. We pray for all people who profess faith in the one God. Strengthen our belief, increase our love, and deepen our commitment to your service. Draw us ever closer to you and to one another. We pray especially for St. Andrew's Clearfield, 
St. James Batavia, St. Andrew's Buffalo, and Good Shepherd Buffalo. O Lord, for your love's sake, we pray for the welfare of the entire world, for those affected by violence, occupational hazards, and natural disasters, for those who are poor and those facing persecution, for refugees and prisoners. Bring peace to all the nations of the earth. Preserve and protect all who suffer or in any need or danger. O oh Lord, for your love's sake, hear prayer. we pray for our nation. Temper our strength with sympathy, our might with justice, our riches with charity, and deliver us from all hardness of heart. O oh Lord, for your love's sake, hear prayer. we pray for the sick for those who suffer from any mental or physical illness, and for those undergoing treatment for disease, for those we know who were sick, and for those we now name, either silently or aloud. O oh Lord, for your love's sake, we commend to your loving care all those who have died, we pray for all those dear to us who have died and for those we now name, either silently or aloud. O oh Lord, for your love's sake. Hear our Lord of love, hear the prayers of your faithful people and the bounty of your love and the multitude of your mercies. Grant that these and all our prayers and petitions as may be best for us and in accordance with your will. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. As we approach this table, may we remember that it belongs to Jesus Christ, who calls all of us to come as we are and receive what is offered, either bread and wine or a blessing. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory, and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made, we acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth, and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints, from every tribe and language and people and nation, to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, upon earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us.
gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. And the blessing of the triune God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain upon you now and evermore. Rejoicing in the Spirit. Thanks be to God. 